PowerPoint, this is my second PowerPoint lecture on adaptive immune response. And we're going we're gonna to talk about the anatomy of the immune system that helps orchestrate the, the connections that are made between our immune system and antigens and really helping to keep the system um, clean and not having stuff spread all over the place. So we have specialized lymphatic vessels that play very important roles in, in keeping our system clean and segregated and not letting the bad guys travel wherever they want to. Um, we have secondary lymphoid organs, and as the name implies, lymphoid, or we've been talking about lymphocytes, B cells, and T cells. These are their major homes in, their, in our body. And then our primary lymphoid organs, where it all begins, right? Primary meaning beginning. So our lymphoid system is very important to the, the design and the functionality of our B cells and T cells effectively doing their job of coming in contact with antigen and responding to it appropriately. And that's the important part, right? The appropriate response. <laughs> in order for them to respond, they have to come in contact with antigen. So the lymphatic vessels are designed to help do just that. The lymphoid organs are designed to just to do that. And the primaries are, the, are where it all begins. So our primary lymphoid organs, where do, the, where do our white blood cells, especially our lymphocytes, come from? Our bone marrow. And for B cells, that's pretty much the end of the story, right? They get also get educated and weeded out there. But for our T cells, one more step, right? Where do they got to go? Thymus. So our two main primary lymphoid organs are your bone is your bone marrow and your thymus. B for B cells, right? Bone marrow for B cells, T for T cells. Although in truth that's not where B cells got their name, but it works out. <laughs> and then as you can see on here, right, all these green vessels are referred to as lymphatic vessels. And these are distinctly different from our blood vessels. Our, our blood system is a circular system. It's a closed system, right? And it circulates around with the heart being the pump to the system. Lymphatic system, on the other hand, is not circular, okay? It starts in the tissues and it drains and its pump is your actual muscular action and the capillary action and the drawing that happens within the vessels. And to keep stuff from flowing back down, there are valves in your lymphatic vessels. So the same thing is, is somewhat true for your circulatory system as it goes for veins, right? You have those valves and you have your muscles and, and the, but you also have that push of stuff through the system, whereas not the case with your lymphatic system. And your lymphatic system a lot of time is equated to the sewage system, right? So like our storm drain system when we have the rain that we had this evening, right? Everything flows into those drains. And then hopefully, right, uh, especially when we're talking about real sewage, the stuff that's draining from your toilets and your sinks and, and, your, and your bathtubs, that gets filtered before it's dumped back into, say, the river. Same thing for our body. What this is doing is it's soaking up fluid when we have inflammation right? It's going to soak up this fluid out of the tissues when you have inflammation. Well, in that fluid could be some bad guys, right? Some pathogens. And because of that, as we travel through the lymphatic vessel system, there are stopping points, what we call lymph nodes. These are filters. These are going to trap the pathogens and filter them out of the fluid that we call lymph. That fluid will travel from the tip of your toe, right, all the way up your body, being filtered numerous times along the way to enter back into circulation at your subclavian veins. You have two ducts, the right and left lymphatic ducts. All your lymphatic system meets up, right, and drains all the fluid into those two ducts. So it all gets connected. Now you'll notice that there are certain areas in your body, especially around your intestines, that you have a lot of lymph nodes. Because again, 
a lot of stuff could potentially enter through the digestive tract. So we want to be able to trap it. And even fats, because they're not very water soluble, actually travel through your lymphatic system, the ones that come from your digestive tract. Right? You have specialized um, lymphatic vessels referred to as lacteals in your small intestines that actually absorb fats and fat soluble vitamins. Um, and it travels much easier through this system because um, it's not it's not the same as your blood that's mostly aqueous. Uh, so we're going to trap that stuff and filter it along the way in lymph nodes. You have large conjugations in your neck region, in your armpit region. Um, the same holds true for, you know, for the lymphatic system in the breast for women, right? And that's why, unfortunately, sometimes cancer can travel to the lymphatic system and get into the lymph nodes. Um, and that's why when they are removing breast tissue, they'll also remove lymph nodes um, that may have been infected. I mean, it's amazing what they can do nowadays when they do these surgeries. They literally will test the lymph nodes and keep taking them until they don't get any more that have cancerous cells. So they get all the cancer, right? And um, so the bad news with that is when you lose that, that system of draining and stuff, women who have had um, mastectomies and stuff like that will sometimes have filled fluid build up in those areas because you have less of a filtering system for getting that stuff back, back out of the region. Um, but, you know, the lymph nodes, to a certain extent, if they can hold it in that area, they're going to help you, right, in keeping it confined. Um, and chalked full in your lymph nodes are macrophages and B cells and T cells. And they're when they trap something, they're going to respond, right? They're going to be activated. They're going to proliferate. And so how many of you guys have had swollen glands in your neck, right? Gone to the doctor, right? And he palpates them. I literally, like, I had an infection when I was in Disney World when I was a kid. And you could see in the pictures, like, my whole neck is swollen, like, in this region. <laughs> it's pretty scary looking. And I had an infection. Um, I had to go to the health clinic and get antibiotics. Um, I don't know exactly what I had, but I definitely had swollen glands. I was definitely having a reaction. And so... Um, when they pet, when the doctor palpates them, right, and they're tender and they're sore, this is a good sign. Because, unfortunately, when lymph nodes are cancerous, when they have cancerous cells in them, they tend to be hard and um, not squishy and not really painful. Um, and, and so that's not a good sign. Not to say that if you have a lymph node that's hard and palpates not painful that it's cancer, right? It could be something else. It could actually be an infection. Uh, but, you know, that's a sure sign that right there your immune system is responding. So we refer to those as secondary lymphoid <coughs> organs, all your lymph nodes. And your body has just got tons of them. And, again, it's to filter all this lymph so that that stuff does not get into your circulation, any of the bad guys. So in addition, a major entry into your body is your nose and mouth, right? And even your eyes are connected to your nose through the lacteal ducts, Okay. And your, your inner ears, a lot of times they get infected because they're connected to your nose through your stationary tubes. Your sinuses in your head, right? These cavities that you have. What's wrong? Yeah, your teeth too. Um, it's, um, it's all connected. And so when you get stuffed up, it's because fluid is building up in your sinuses. <clears throat> And your voice, when you talk, resonates through those cavities in your, in your skull. And so that's why someone can tell that you have inflammation in your sinuses by the change in your voice, right? And why we sound stuffed up, right? Which is like kind of a constant state. <laughs> right? I forgot to take my medicine before I left the house today. I was concerned about the rain, right? It was rushing out the door. I didn't take my medicine, so I'm having a hard time breathing through my nose. Um, so, um, so in your in your nose too, in the very back of your nose, you have a tonsil that's sometimes referred to as your adenoids, but it's actually only one, or your nasopharyngeal tonsil. And unfortunately, it's also positioned right in between where your estaciary tubes enter into your nose. So for some individuals, if that swells, it also blocks the stationary tubes and blocks the drainage of stuff out of your inner ear. So in that case, it can cause stuff to back up and cause um, damage 
and inflammation in the inner ear and fluid buildup in the inner ear. So like for my son, especially for kids, when you're little, you don't have quite the pitch. Your, your head isn't as big as it's going to be, believe it or not. You don't have quite the pitch to your stationary tube, so stuff doesn't easily drain into your nose. It's much more lateral. So fluid tends to stay. And then if you have allergies, like what turns out to be my son's problem, thanks to me, which I can thank my parents because it's hereditary, right? His uh, his adenoids would swell, and it would also block the, the stationary tubes. So when they did the surgery to put the tubes in his ears to help relieve until his body grew enough that you have more of that movement of the fluid down into the nose to let the fluid go out the ears through the tympatic membrane by putting tiny little microscopic tubes in his ears. Um, in addition, they, they took a large portion of his adenoids so they wouldn't continue inflaming and blocking the stationary tubes. So I kind of wish sometimes, I'm like, man, I kind of wish I probably had that surgery done. But um, when you're an adult, <laughs> surgeries are, are much more risky than when you're a kid. Uh, and so if I can fix it other ways, I'm, I'm not a, letting anyone purposely cut me. But um, same thing with your sinuses, right? So stuff will come from your nose and fill up, right, and, and infect your, your sinuses. Um, so for some people with constant problems, it could be allergy. Um, and then that leaves you more predisposed to infection. So I have to really worry that, you know, if I stay stuffed up too long, I have too much fluid, I have too much nutrients there, I can get a secondary infection, like a bacterial infection. It can be really severe. Um, and, and viruses, too, which you can't go to the doctor and get antibiotics for, unfortunately. Um, can't do much about that. So that you have that major tonsil. And most people are aware of the ones in your throat, right? The palatine tonsils. And these sometimes will swell up for people. And the problem with that is in your throat, right? So you can't breathe, you can't eat. Uh, it can cause some serious problems. So for some people, they, you know, again, if they're con having continual infections and problems with that, they'll sometimes have their tonsils removed. And that's what they're talking about when they say tonsils. It's the palatine tonsils. There's one associated with your tongue, although I've never heard of anybody having any issues with it. I think it's a relatively lowly active um, tonsil. Doesn't get um, doesn't get used as often. Um, when you look in somebody's throat, very rarely are you going to see their tonsils, unless I mean you're seriously looking down their throat um, and they're seriously inflamed. That cute little punching bag is part of your soft palate, right? which helps protect when you swallow stuff from going up your nose. And most people have experienced this sometimes with soda and stuff that fizzes. It gets up past that soft palate, right? And uh, you feel it up in the back of your nose because your, your nose is connected to your throat, right? And that's the purpose of the soft palate. So that is not your tonsil, the cute little punching bag. It's your uvula, right? That is the name of it. And if you've seen Monster House... <laughs> You'll know about the uvula, right? So even the house had a uvula. And uh, yeah, for some people, if you tickle it, they're going to throw up, right? They're very sensitive. Um, I'm one of those people that uh, it doesn't take much. Going to the dentist is a nightmare for me. <laughs> Just knock my ass out, please. Numb me up. The last time I was puking all over the place. So... Your, your lymph nodes, your spleen, your tonsils, even your appendix. Um, and then again, your adenoid, like I said, it is actually a tonsil, even though we say it plural. Uh, your appendix, which, which is a portion of your um, large intestine that hangs off, has a large number of white blood cells. So unfortunately, if that gets inflamed, you can bust and hold your intestines. You have your intestines, your outsides leaking on your insides, and could be a really serious problem. Um, the appendix doesn't actually have any functionality for us. Back when we probably ate different types of food sources, it may have been a useful portion of our intestines, but is no longer a useful portion. Uh, and um, the unfortunate thing is that stuff can get trapped in it, and um, it can get quite inflamed because there's a large number of white blood cells that are present there. Spleen. What does it filter? blood. It filters your blood. And it is the one organ you can actually live without. Right? No one gets a spleen transplant. The other functionalities of your spleen, organs like your liver will take over if you lose your spleen. 
but it does leave you more susceptible to bloodborne pathogens because you don't have this filter now specifically just for your blood. Right. And 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 most of the time, you know, serious infection, um, like mono could potentially cause the rupture of the spleen. Most of the time people who lose their spleens is uh accidents, automobile accidents, trauma accidents. Um, but as I said, the good news with that is you don't have to worry about getting a, a transplant. You can actually live without it. You just probably wouldn't prefer to. I know I wouldn't. So as again, blunt ended system, right? So it's, it's in our tissues. It's going to suck up that extra fluid that leaks out of the circulation when you have inflammation. So those aren't the only places, your lymph nodes, your spleen, right, these tonsils, your appendix, these aren't the only places where you have large collections, but it's the only place where it's like organized to the, an organ level. Um, you have lots of what's referred to as associated lymphoid tissue. So it's at the tissue level, it's not at the organ level. And of course, the main entry points for the body is where you want to have this protection. So you have what we call mucus-associated lymphoid tissue, or MALT for short. So all along your mucous membranes, and you can see this, like when you're in AMP2 and you look at the small intestine under the microscope, and you're looking at those priors patches, these are dense collections of white blood cells, specifically lymphocytes, B cells and T cells, to be able to respond to invaders that get past that mucosal layer. And then you have the fighters right on scene, right? You have the macrophages. You have the dendritic cells. And the reason why they get that name is that they can literally have long cellular projections. They actually literally antigen sample on a regular basis, right? They're called Langerhans cells in your skin. Same thing. They're dendritic cells. They're antigen samplers. They're going to san sample antigens, and they're going to present them to your immune system. They do this continuously. You have specialized M cells in your intestines as well that do just that. They antigen sample, and they present that information to the macrophages. What's the bad news here? Is that some pathogens have taken advantage of this, right? They use our system in antigen sampling. They get in, and the macrophage is supposed to do what? It's supposed to engulf it and destroy it by phagocytosis. Well, there are some pathogens out there that get in, and can jump out of the phagosome. They can get out of the macrophage even. Some of them, even when the macrophage dumps the digestive enzymes, they're sitting in there going, that doesn't hurt me. <laughs> this looks like a nice home for me, right? So mycobacteria tuberculosis is like that. It actually grows in macrophages' phagolysosomes. It doesn't affect them. It just grows. It grows slow, but it grows. Right? We can't kill it. And then our skin, right? That's a major entry point. So all along your skin, like I said, you've got those dendritic cells. They're called Langerhans cells there. They're continually antigen sampling. And I forget, somebody put um, in our discussion board a link for uh, an animation that was super cool where you see the dendritic cells traveling into the lymph vessels, Ooh. right? And then traveling and, and showing that information to the B cells and T cells, pretty cool stuff. Um, so, you know, we have this all the time, layers of protection, layers of being able to respond, and, and to this, this high level of degree of specificity of producing antibodies that specifically recognize this stuff. So especially in this area, in the mucous membranes, most of these B cells are programmed to make IgA, right? So then it's going to get secreted into the mucus. So anything that those guys sampled in, right, then they're going to secrete IgA, and it's going to bind to that stuff and stop it from gaining entry in and going further into the body. So I think we're going to stop there. Some of these markers, right, were kind of introduced in the first video we watched, right? And we're going to go through um, and talk about these interactions between T cells and B cells and how they talk to each other and antigen presentation and how that happens next time.